not long before he died in that plane wreck, John Jr. called me one day just out of the blue. <laughs> he said, Fred, how the hell are you? <laughs> hey, you got to like the guy. Just a friendly guy. He said, I'm going to make you one of my most fascinating men. Number one is uh, that goofy governor of uh, Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, Dennis Hastert, speaker. Number two, George, George W. Bush, number three, and Anthony Williams, who's the mayor of Washington, is four. So there I come, number five. Look at old Geraldo, number 16. See, he ain't nothing. 16. And old Larry Flint's number 20. That ought to give him pause for dating with me. Anyway, that's good. I hated to see the guy get killed. I kind of, I really liked it. message that you're about to hear it may offend some and this station either this station or any of our sponsors support it you know howard stern now that's a little bit of an insult isn't it to me for a guy like howard stern old potty mouth himself says now this may be offensive that stuff you've been doing ain't offensive, but I, me talking five months is offensive. Right here, get right here. You're pathetic. You people are pathetic. You're a disgrace to your own God and your own Bible. Some big Miami station had me debating Larry Flint. Flint. Larry Flint. And I said, I'm sorry that Paul Wells sued you in that silly case because I think you've got the right to say that if you want to say it. I said, and I'll tell you another thing, Brother Larry. Your chances of getting to heaven are better than your Paul Wells. I feel, sorry. I feel sorry for you, D. If you try to make anything out of this film. When I was uh, 14, I started going to a Baptist church. And that's when my life changed. And his changed about when he was 16. I was just a happy little kid, Eagle Scout. Graduated from high school when I was 16, top of the class, 250-something, I think. Had an appointment to West Point, you know, military academy. His dad, you know, helped get him his appointment to West Point because he had some political clout, I guess. And then he got saved in an evangelistic meeting. Well, I had a genuine religious heart experience, a genuine deep-down dose. So he turned down the appointment to West Point and started preaching, going to Bible school. And his, well, needless to say, his, his dad wasn't happy with it. My dad said, Bubba, you are not making people mad enough quick enough. He was mad at me. He said, I recommend you start just kicking them in the shin. As soon as you meet somebody, just kick them in the shin. Then you won't have to mess around waiting to make them mad because you're certainly making them mad. <laughs> He was the southern gentleman, his accent, and uh, I liked the way he preached. When the Lord Jesus Christ in his own words describes in some little detail that great drama that's the most important event in all of human history, time, and eternity, this event, the great general judgment. Lord Jesus Christ, then shall he say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For uh, when you had opportunity at one of Billy Graham's campaigns, you went forward, took good old Jesus as your very own personal Savior. No! Get real! 
I was going to a church in Glendale, which is a suburb of Phoenix then. It isn't now, but he uh, came there to preach. I remember I went down, I kneeled down on my knees and took Jesus as my Savior. Yeah, you wanted a super bellboy to help you carry your baggage through life. That's all you wanted, you hypocrite, you. I was working for the lady whose husband brought him there. Uh, he was traveling, he brought him in to speak at the church. And uh, that's where I met him in their home. They had him there to eat. You simply cannot open the Bible anywhere, anywhere, I dare you! And you're very shortly going to come upon this subject of the wrath of God and it's sooner or later going to creep into the edges of your understanding that the love of God and the mercy of God is reserved for the penitent. Penitent. Mrs. Woods was an Italian lady, so she was matchmaking. <laughs> you want to go to hell? Fine. Fine. I love you. I love the thoughts of you going to hell. I got some Bible here. I'll be paying close attention to you, brother, sister, in hell. As the eternal ages roll by, I'll be watching you suffer and all the nuances of your exquisite torment and pain and how you do. Eternity, you know, is a long time. I'll be watching you. I'll be watching you. Paying close attention. But then she found out he was a little younger, so she said, oh, you don't want him. <laughs> but he had other ideas, I guess. Dry deadhead preachers talking about God, yeah, you love you, and you're gonna be such a wonderful blah, 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 blah. Ain't nobody listening to you but hell-bound sinners and reprobates. We were engaged quite early. We hadn't known each other very long. You crazy fool Greeks in your stupid, gross darkness. And all your philosophies and great teachers are like blind men groping, groping, groping. I was 27 when the oldest was born, and I was 42 when the 13th one was born. I had Fred Jr., Mark, Catherine, Margie, Shirley, Nathan, Jonathan, Rebecca, Elizabeth, Timothy, Dortha, Rachel, and Abigail. Name most of them. You know, he'd always pick out the name. And he liked the children. He wanted the children. concurrent with the uh, with the Brown decision when I got to Topeka, you know, Brown versus Board of Education. And I had had problems with, at Bob Jones with uh, racial discrimination. Somehow it didn't suit my understanding of the scriptures. Uh, it seemed to me that as an adjunct to what I was preaching, that nobody was effectuating any civil rights in this Jim Crow town. No lawyer was doing anything about it. I went to the law school and I effectuated the Civil Rights Act. Both uh, the Brown case opened it up and the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was no big thing when he started in those days. If the phone rang and you picked it up to have someone on the other end of that phone screaming at you, uh, all manner of nigger lover and things like that. And we had our cars shot up and the building was shot up and just anything like that was bound to happen. So we we seem to have always had a little controversy that surrounds us. My youngest brother, Tim, who lives across the street here, 
he was in grade school and my dad reopened that Brown versus Board of Education case that, you know, came out of Topeka. Four or five kids beat the crap out of him on the way home from school one day. Kids just come to school and just start hitting me. And it was so bizarre to me. I mean, I was a quiet kid. I wasn't like real social. And at that time, we were in a school that was predominantly white. It was the newest and fanciest school in town. The parents didn't appreciate suddenly having to have black kids come into their school and it trickled down and it was just an amazingly hostile environment. I'm telling you that when you read that God has a one blood created all nations of men, it is impossible thereafter to believe that any one of them is different essentially, fundamentally or better or worse than any other one and that's what the old preachers preached. And therefore, it, it, it's a part of my ministry uh, when that law school close, is close at hand and when I have a natural propensity for such things to just get a law degree. It was very easy. I was editor of the, of the law journal and captain of the moot court team, those two extracurricular activities, either one of which is a man killer. I was both of them. And when I graduated, had 10 children. Uh, that was a third of the whole of the whole class. All the rest of the law students put together graduating when I did had 20 <laughs> and I had 10. Since our father had, in, had taught us and ingrained in us the notion that there is no difference between any human versus another human, we all are of the same blood, um, it was a bizarre concept to me that anybody would would honestly and genuinely believe that, that different races meant different qualities. Where we went to school, where our kids go today, there was like two black families in that whole grade school, middle school, high school on the southwest part of Topeka. Today it's more like a third of the kids are black because of that reopening of that case. For the last uh, 46 years, we've declared war on this community uh, by lawsuit after lawsuit for uh, black civil rights. And in fact, we were the only ones doing it for a long, long time. My father had the, the, the perseverance, the diligence, the strength to know how to get into federal court and to, and to represent people's rights that had been violated way too long. And he got big victories, big ju money judgments. I had the first uh all white jury give a black assistant city attorney here a whole lot of money because they had fired him and replaced him with a young white lawyer right out of law school. A guy named Bill Glenn. Glenn versus Topeka. There's guys still w wetting their pants just over the prospect of having to litigate with him. I'm talking seasoned attorneys, physically afraid. They would shake when you come to the courtroom. He was, he was, he was a wild man. He might be a little heavy-handed, you know, he might be a little hard to take, he might say what he thinks, and it may not be something you want to hear, but his heart was not wrong, and, and that's why they hated him. Back then, the challenge was, why do you want to disrupt the community? That was basically it. Why, when everything's so peaceful and wonderful, it's okay. Uh, people are just trying to learn to get along with black people. You know, you can't, I ain't got nothing against black people. I think everyone ought to own one, that kind of a attitude. In this community, they hated us uh, for the first 40, 50 years because we, we said, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and to the stranger that sojourns among you, and that he is made of, of one blood, all nations to dwell upon the earth, and hath appointed beforehand the bounds of their habitation. During the Civil Rights Movement, at KU, there were lots of sit-ins, and those black students would be arrested, and there was a prosecutor over in Douglas County that would prosecute them. So one of the first things my dad did when he got out of law school was go over there and defend those students. And one of those students was Gail Sayers. They couldn't get a white lawyer to go to Lawrence and defend Gail Sayers and those 102 black people. So they came to me. And we commenced to suffer the same kind of vilification by the paper, same kinds of assaults and batteries beating my kids up because I was determined by God Almighty in heaven that this was a shame and a disgrace and we were going to stop it. And then the people came along that didn't have any money and nobody wanted to be bothered with them. They're just trash anyway. But their rights were at stake and he 
didn't care they didn't have the money. He, he took the time to uh, represent the rights. Fred Phelps is good at raising cane in the courtroom and just about everywhere else. My good. Passed out my stuff. It's earned him the wrath of some, the respect of others. On this day, he's accepting an award for his civil rights crusade, a crusade that began years ago when he was growing up in Mississippi. I say, there's only one class of people got treated worse than Negroes. And that was what those cultured white people called Negro lovers. It's God Almighty, you understand, never said it's an abomination to be black or old or disabled or female. All of those are protected classes in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, the fags want to be added to that. Uh, those that have been discriminated against, especially by government, uh, unwarranted because of immutable conditions of being. Understand, immutable conditions of being. You are black. It's not something you do. They deserve the protection of the law. That's Bible. But these evil creatures that the Bible calls beasts and other uncomplimentary un, uh, uh, names and metaphors, they define themselves not by an immutable condition of being, but by conduct voluntarily engaged in and not neutral conduct but despicable conduct, filthy conduct, immoral, depraved, sinful, criminal conduct. And they say, look, I voluntarily engage in this filth, therefore pass laws to make me a protected class. So you can't even preach against me. You can't even preach against me. It was a totally unexpected turn of events when the first time we went to a picket. Prior to the first picket sign ever going up, we had conversed with our city council, the city fathers, the mayor and so forth, because there is a park not far from here called Gage Park that is notorious. In this town and across this country, if you travel in the homosexual circles, for being a place where homosexuals meet and have sex out in this public park where you take children and so forth. It was a very public thing that everybody knew was going on. On the southwest corner of the Gage Park, men would gather in the daytime and go back into this uh, wooded area, and everybody knew what they were doing. This little area is the place where these homosexuals during the day, I'm talking lunch hour, you can go over there probably on this day and watch this activity where these men go in and out of that wooded area. And at night, you go over there, and it's like a whole com world of activity. At about 9.30, a procession of vehicles would begin circling the park. People familiar with Gage say they see the same cars night after night. A few of the drivers would stop and talk with each other. One man spent half an hour parked outside a restroom reading a newspaper by dome light. Many times, drivers will rendezvous at the end of one of two out-of-the-way cul-de-sacs. On this Saturday night, these two men had more on their mind than just a friendly chat. One man performed oral sex on the other. We sent a man wired for sound out into the park undercover to talk with these late night drivers. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look around for a while, okay? Later, this man stopped to talk again. This time, he wanted more. He offered our man oral sex. So what? Uh, our city councilman at that time, Jim Reardon, I talked to him, he told me that he'd gone through there jogging and found mattresses back in the bushes 
and that um, he'd get them to take them out and they'd put them back in. We used to be quite active in running. They ride their bicycles through the park and run in the park. One of my sons, Timothy, came home one night and he was so upset because he'd been chased through the park by two homosexuals. And he just ran and ran. <laughs> Several of our young men, including my son, had been accosted in broad daylight over here at Gage Park. It's just about half a mile away, being propositioned. And it just, it was getting worse and worse. And see, we naively thought, well, the city fathers, they just don't know. One day, my dad was out on a bicycle ride with my then five-year-old son, Joshua. And they went over to that park, and my dad would ride out ahead of him and then circle back. They were passing by that wooded area, and as he circled back, he realized that there was a guy coming out of that wooded area trying to lure Josh over into those bushes. And that was like the last straw, and my, or maybe the only straw it would have taken to get my dad to write a letter that was quite colorful to the city father saying, this should not be so. To the honorables, mayor, council members, the chief of police, city building, Speaker Candace, dear friends, call them friends. A malodorous sore with the scab off is open and running at the extreme southwest corner of Gage Park. At any hour of the day or night, a park official told me, male couples may be seen entering and exiting the area. He regularly passes along citizen complaints to his superiors in vain. My children, grandchildren, and I are offended and embarrassed as we bike and jog in the park. Why would this picnic table be located in a place like this. It's obviously not for family picnics. Gage Park is officially touted as a wholesome family place. Gage Park also appears on a nationally circulated clandestine list as a homosexual rendezvous point and safe house. My question, do you think Gage Park's running sore could be permanently fixed, Your Honor? Your consideration is appreciated sincerely, Fred W. Phelps. That was July 18, 1989. The list I referred to in the letter is the Damron address book that's edited and republished annually. There are tens of thousands of these places. They call them Cruisy, C-R-U-I-S-Y areas. And Gage Park was prominent on the list of places where homosexuals from all over the country can go and have uh, uh, anonymous sex uh, and not worry about police authorities. And he got a letter back and then from the mayor saying, you're right, and this isn't good, and it's been this way for a long time. And while I was park commissioner, I kind of cleaned it up, and now it's been allowed to return to this condition of things. Dear Fred, thanks for your colorful letter concerning Gage Park. We are well aware of the situation. We cleaned it up when I was park commissioner, but it was allowed to return over the last four years. We are in the process of putting together a program to bring the situation to a halt. Keep us posted. Sincerely, Harry Butch Falker, Mayor. July 21, 1989. The mayor, who was Butch Falker then, and he was a good guy, he said he would do something, and he never did. And we just kept, you know, going down there, reminding him of the situation. I don't know how many times Fred Sr. went there to the city council and talked to them about it. We went to the city council and we tried to speak at the public speaking time. And the mayor ordered um, our pastor arrested for uh, using rather moderate language to describe the city's inaction. I think his reference was, uh, you've sat around like last year's Christmas tree, doing nothing about the problem. The mayor promptly ordered the chief of police to to remove him from, from the place. We tried heroically with visits to the city council on Tuesday night, letters and phone calls to get them to enforce the law. Like the mayor said he was aware of and that he had a program and he was going to stop it. it. Didn't stop, it only got worse. And so we got some little dinky signs and said things like, watch out for gays in the bushes. And we weren't using uh, strong language. It's so funny to me to think back. Little dinky signs, they were fairly innocuous. We used the word gay back then. And I mean, you'd have thought that the world was coming to an end the way people... We lanced a huge boil without knowing it. We thought 
that if we just went over and would get a little uh, media attention, that that would wake the city uh, governing authorities up, the police department, and that they would uh, begin some kind of a moderate uh, effort. Uh, it wouldn't take much, we thought, to drive those openly promiscuous homosexuals out of Gage Park. Boy, were we wrong. You'd think that the, the sky had fallen. And they started editorializing against us in the strongest language possible in the newspaper. Uh, they, militant homosexual groups from Lawrence, would surround our pickets, literally uh, threatening our lives. And the police would uh, encourage it. No. Yeah, fuck you. Yeah. So help me God, I'll kick the shit out of all three of you. Yes. Pressing up against people had signs that said stuff like, I hugged your kid today and it felt good, uh, good. and other kinds of things that just left you going, oh my, you know, you'd cringe, literally. The ordinary person doesn't know what the fags do and what they're agenda is. The ordinary person thinks that they're just simple-hearted, sincere, friendly people uh, that are being uh, mistreated and bashed and who need the protection of the law, therefore, so they won't be bashed. It just broke loose. I mean, those uh, they just started coming in droves, of, and they started bringing the Bible into it. We hadn't mentioned the Bible. You know, we just wanted that place cleaned up, you know, where the children are and where people want to exercise and ride their bikes and things. But it turned into a big thing. And then on the heels of that, here's my dad going along. You know, he grew up back in Mississippi, back when people were kind of decent. And he thought that the 400-some churches in Topeka just didn't know about it. So he gets him a letter. I remember sitting over there, stuffing those envelopes, sending a letter to every church in this community saying, do you want to step up and be counted here? You must not know this is going on. It grew exponentially. And about a year in, into this picket, when they were having a humongous counter-protest in the park called Sunday in the Park Without Fred, is what they called it. It was an organized group. The ring leaders were some of these local big churches, Episcopalians, Catholics, Methodists. They had shirts made. It was a cottage industry. I mean, the boil we lanced was far greater in the religious community than in the political or the homosexual. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have drawn with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? my way. Are you going to move? Are you going to move? Washing up in silver spray, we will walk and worship People started writing us letters, getting phone calls, uh, threatening us, and making it a religious issue. So we just put God's side out. We put Bible sentiments on the signs and started going every day. And Make a sign! God hates fats! That's all you gotta do! The first big sign that was made I made it, and it said, God hates gays. 
I remember standing there after the sky had caved in over these signs and it was kind of quiet for a moment and I said most of these people would give us the fag it's the God hates that's sending them over the edge that's what the Bible teaches and we can make it a, a compendium you can't put it any more simple than that yeah it's catchy and it's easy to put on a sign because they're all all the words are small but it sure got attention it is the notion that there's a right and wrong and that there's accountability for doing wrong that is a dying concept in our society and it's all that case sera sera I remember growing up that was when it was shifting and I remember teachers would say if you don't have something nice to say don't say anything at all or live and let live judge not lest you be judged blah 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 that's the psycho babble mentality that's driving this train it suddenly washed over me that everybody in this country no everybody in this world are going to is going to see these signs and they're going to have to make a judgment they're going to have to decide between good and evil and they're going to have to take a side on it they're going to have to take a position Fag, that's a profound theological statement. It needs to be preached. This nation needs it. This world needs it. Look, the language, 12 little words to fix this country. 12 little words. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. And there's a semicolon there. It is abomination. That's the Vicar's 1822. The pernicious nature of that sin is such that the homosexual can't repent. Glory, glory, I'm a gay man. See, it's an axiomatic matter of fact that nobody is going to repent of something he's proud of. Definitions get in the way there. These fags are proud of it. Hi, I'm a faggot and God loves me. Gay Pride Week. A gay Pride Parade. Clinton called June Gay Pride Month last year. It is Jeremiah 615 time. Were they ashamed when they had committed these abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall with them that fall. You understand, that sin is peculiar and pernicious because it's the only sin that the sinner can't, under any circumstances, be sorry for. You know, uh, out here on Menninger Hill, they think everything is genetic, and that if you are a kleptomaniac, it's because your genes are all out of whack going that way. And if you are a axe murderer or a serial killer, uh, you need a treatment. I mean, you were just born uh, with those things, and if you, <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> I'm telling you, to a Bible preacher, I don't care how you got in your sinful condition, you got to stop it. And the verse is second, is a Titus 2.9, uh, that the grace of God has now appeared, uh, bringing salvation and teaching us that denying ungodliness, the word translated denying there means resisting it ungodliness, worldly lusts. You should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present time looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the truth. The gospel says you've got these urges, but you're not supposed to glorify them and brag about them and indulge them to the max and insist that laws be passed making it all right. You resist them and you call on the Lord God Almighty and live your life on this earth soberly and righteously. And the God, that's the answer to that genetic canard and righteousness. And the God, that's the answer to that genetic canard. You know, 
the fags at almost every uh, radio talk show I'm on, some fag sooner or later call in and says, what would you do if one of your children came and said, I'm gay? Or one of your grandchildren came and said, I'm gay? Well, in the first place, that's not going to happen. I mean, they might slink off in the dead of night, but ain't none of my kids or grandkids going to come look me in the face after they've been listening to my preaching ever since they were born and say I'm gay. But that's supposition on the opponent in Essie. Playing the game, I'd say, bye. Bye. I said that to an Australian radio station last week, and the guy said, bye. See, they don't understand what that means, see. So I had to explain that to him. It was kind of comical. That'd be the, that'd be the last. Look, I got, I'm bound for the promised land. Very shortly now, I'm going to be in the presence of the great God Almighty, and eternal issues are going to be finally disposed of. I'm looking forward to it. I got no time to mess with you. If after you knowing all this truth, you've decided to mess around in that filthy kind of a sin, bye. If you got to castrate your miserable self with a piece of rusty barbed wire, do it. That's Bible. It's a little colorful, but it's in uh, Matthew 19 where the Savior says if it takes you being a eunuch, some men, he said, are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs by other men. Those Oriental monarchs made their harem keepers eunuchs. You know. And some men make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake. Don't come in here telling me that you've got to anally copulate your brains out or you can't be happy. And then the Savior said, if your right hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to enter into heaven maimed than having both hands and both feet go to hell where the worm that eats on them never dies and the fire is never quenched. And if it's your eye, your right eye that offends you, pluck it out, cast it from you. Better to enter into life blind both eyes to go to hell. This is very serious business and certainly the Savior preaching that way indicates that it's serious, uh, a serious matter. Likewise also men in the changing, blah, 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 blah. This preaching condemns this world. Nobody on the judgment day is going to be able to say, but, but we didn't know. Phelps told you. I think he's energized. Uh, I think that uh, it's his life. I think he was called to preach. I think it's something that he's been absolutely 100% sincerely dedicated to since he was 16, 17 years old. Don't you understand, if you've got a commission uh, that runs like uh, Isaiah 58.1, to cry aloud and spare not and lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, and how do you how do you cry aloud? And how do you lift up your voice like a trumpet in order to show a thing, to show a thing to human contemporaries? And look, my job is to get this that I have to say in the name of God to every contemporaneously living with me, uh, son and daughter of Adam. That's my job. Now, how, how do you do that? You've got to figure some way in this day and age to get media attention, for want of a better word.
wonderful resource the Lord sent us. Incidentally, the Lord uh, gave that knowledge of the Internet just so we could be on it, you know. All the rest of these people, we're glad to have them sharing it, but uh, <laughs> he didn't do it for Larry Flint and these pornographers are making millions off of it. He did it so that we could cross these boundaries and preach this gospel where they try to slam doors shut and won't let us otherwise be, have an audience. The GodHatesAmerica.com has been around for just over a year. GodHatesFags.com has been around for, we're coming up on three and a half years. And before that I had done uh, a webpage for our church, but it, we didn't have our own domain. We got the name registered, and then after that they decided, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't have let them register that name. And so they wanted us to change it, but they said they weren't going to change it since they let us register it in the first place. It's hard to find somebody to, to host a controversial website, so we've basically gone from one provider to the next. Um, we get attacked a lot with denial of service attacks. People are pretty brave when they're sending email, so I get lots of death threats, lots of people saying that they're going to beat us up if we ever get anywhere near them, um, or kill us, shoot us, I'm going to burn your church down. Um, just all kinds of threats. The most common one is if you ever get anywhere near where I live, I'm going to kick your ass. That's, that's, you know, a couple, several times a week I get one of those. I usually respond to those with, um, where do you live? And the next time we're anywhere near there, then we'll be sure to come by and pick it. I have also gotten a lot of threats from hackers saying that we will you know, by this time next week we're going to have your site taken down and nobody's ever going to be able to bring it back up again. Most of the feedback on the, that I get through email is pretty negative. It's been as high as 50,000 a day and it's been as low as a couple hundred a day. But on average it's two to three thousand a day. I'm talking about visitors, I'm not talking about page hits. Individual visitors, no matter how many pages they look at while they're there. The stuff that happened to Yahoo and CNN that kind of stuff has been happening to us since the very beginning and really nobody cares because it's GodHatesFags.com but as soon as it is a commercial site then suddenly the FBI is into it. Sure. The sin of Sodom was that they accepted sexual perversion. Not necessarily that everybody in that city engaged in it because they obviously didn't but that they accepted it. Um, and that's what's happening today, everywhere you go, in the whole world, with very few exceptions. You know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if God came right now. Um, also wouldn't surprise me if He came in another thousand years. I don't have any idea when He's coming. But I, but I can look around me and see the signs. It says in uh, Matthew uh, 16, the Lord Jesus Christ said, uh, You get up of a morning and look out the door, look at the sky, you say, hmm, I think this is going to be a fair day. You get up in the morning, look at the sky, and the clouds are dark and lowering and reddish in their tent. You say, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a very bad day. He said, you hypocrites, you, you can discern the face of the sky, but you will not discern the signs of the times. We got a duty to discern what the heck's happening in, the, in that realm. The upside down flag means the, the organization that's represented by the flag, the nation or whatever, is in distress. And this nation is in distress. We've reached a point of defiance that no nation has been able to go to without being destroyed. Defiance of God. Our message is clear. This is where you've gone wrong. You spit in God's face and everything else is symptoms. It's, it's rotten at the core. I mean, look. We can't build prisons fast enough. We can't, we can't deal with all the crisis that we have day to day. So what do we do instead is just pretend that it's all fine and go on kind of half living. I mean, good Lord, how many people do you know that don't in one way or another live in complete denial about, their, about what this nation is, is about? 
one of the things I do is oversee education in our in the prisons, and I've talked to many teachers in the prisons who tell me that they feel much safer teaching in prisons than they do in our public high school. There's no control over the children. The children have become our oppressors. That's one major sign that this world is close to coming to an end. You have some nations that you can't even touch your child. If you even touch your child, that child can sue you and be taken away from you. We have no respect uh, for parents as a general rule. We have no respect for authority. We have no discipline. We're losing our work ethic. I'll tell you who's going to take the most heat, in my opinion, from most people, are their parents. Because the parents start with the slate, the clean slate. You got this tiny baby, this little thing that you set in, set in motion the course of their life. And you don't tell them about God. You don't tell them about heaven or hell or eternity or those vital things that affect their souls for eternity. That's just foolishness to my mind. It's hard to beat these signs the way I do it. It's a formidable little uh, sign. You know that Columbine massacre? Well, when that happened and Gore came out there and held a big rally and they had about 100,000 people the first few days after it happened, well, we went out there and picketed that whole thing and were the center of it all. I mean, those people were mad. And the message to them was, you taught these kids from the time they started school that it's okay to be gay. So therefore, you busted their moral compass. The same God that said, thou shalt not kill, said, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, and I fixed the death penalty for both sins. And you taught them that God didn't mean what he said about one, so if it's okay to be gay, it's okay to kill. You are teaching the kids in this evil place that it's okay to kill. Now you're reaping the harvest of that godless curriculum. That's what we was telling them as they passed by. See, now that is a very good sign. Some woman out there this morning was enraged over this sign. So we got one like this on sticks. See? And on these we're going to carry on airplanes without sticks. I'm putting the priest on one side and the uh, black nuns on the other side. Anyway, that'd be very good stuff. It'll be on the front page of some paper. Really? It's offensive. Personally, I find it offensive. I think it creates a lot of negative energy.
I'm telling you. These signs just shake these people up so bad. You see them flags flying upside down. They want everybody to think this is a wonderful country and everybody's going to heaven and all. <laughs> That's what they thought in old Sodom, too, till the rain started. Looking at what happened in New York and reading anything in it other than a stroke of God's wrath upon this evil nation, an expression of his vengeance towards it is heresy. And anybody that interprets it any other way, other way than that will answer to the Lord God for it on the judgment day and including and particularly including uh, George W. Bush. Bush has done more to propel this country into final oblivion and doom under the wrath of God than all 43 presidents, including Clinton, put before him. All this chatter and this happy talk about how we're great people and we're a holy people and we're fighting evil and we're good and they're evil and we're going to rebuild and not, rec not recognizing or even willing to concede that this is a monstrously sinful nation that has been punished by God and needs to repent. And the reason they can't repent is they've gone so far that the Lord says, I'm through with you. And in order to assure that you don't repent, I'm going to send you strong delusion that you should believe a lie. This stuff that they're claiming to believe, that this monstrous sin of the Sodomites is merely an innocent alternate lifestyle, is such a profoundly soul-shattering lie that unless they had strong delusion, they would never believe it. And no intelligent, patriotic American will fly that flag any way but upside down. A bunch of uh, heathen idolaters that are making an incestuous, uh, idolatrous orgy of so-called uh, phony patriotism needs to be denounced needs to be squarely and roundly denounced from the scriptures that it is a great sin. God hates America. Have a nice day. <laughs> you know, pantheism means God's everywhere and in everything, and you're God, and I'm God, and that flower's God, and that snake's God, and everything's God, and all that. Just pure silliness. That was the worm in the American apple. Democracies tend to pantheism, because the spirit of the times in a democracy has power to change the very substance of religion. In, in other words, people get the notion in a democracy that when they get a majority vote, they can do anything they want to, even change the Bible, and cancel out and repeal what God Almighty said about this or that, exactly what's happening in this country today. In 1988, Gore persuaded us that he was a good Bible-believing Baptist from Carthage, Tennessee, that he opposed abortion, he opposed the gay rights agenda, and he did. Yeah, he was here at the House in 1989, after, the year after he ran for president. Since I knew Gore, I was able to get him to come to Kansas to be the keynote speaker at our convention. We had the event at my house. You know, I'd, I'd been a, a coordinator of his campaign in, in Kansas in 1988. Um, and, you know, he had volunteers that came through the state and they worked out of our office and he he's, was and I assume still is extremely courteous and given what, what his wife had done with the lyrics and rock music and so on, you know, I certainly felt that he was, uh, was a religious person. Because Gore was against fags, against abortion, and we were helping him. We put up his people, all the people in this church kept his people. In 1988, um, there were a lot of Democrats running for president. I don't know if you remember that year, but there was probably eight or ten all told, because it was a wide open year with Reagan leaving. 
Uh, and I, you know, I spent some time and looked at the field, and I felt like he best represented the, uh, what, I, what I would call the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. I'm telling you, the boy has backslid on us. He wouldn't dare oppose the gay agenda. He wouldn't dare lift a voice to tell any truth now. In fact, he's doing just the opposite. But you know, he don't have a single principle that's not for sale. Expediency is his only rule. He wanted to become a national candidate, and he saw to do so, especially with the Democratic Party, that was the only way he could go. And he's, you know, pretty much sold his soul, if you will, for votes. Bush had to make concessions to the fags, too, met with them down there in Austin. Like, I think I've told you this before, I went to the Democratic National Committee meeting in Washington, D.C. in 1985, and the homosexuals were outside the hotel. It was the same hotel where Reagan was shot. Remember that? And they were outside, the gay rights people were outside holding signs. Three years later at the National Convention in Atlanta, they were inside as delegates. Stand up on a big platform, right over here, just behind me to the right, was the Staples Convention Center. Right over here to my left was Bunker Hill. And I'm standing there, preaching this same thing and saying, we have come from Kansas to inject a little sanity and truth into this insane orgy of fag lies going on over there, calling itself a Democratic National Convention. I'm also telling you that probably the biggest hypocrite on the earth today in these times is Senator Joe Lieberman. Biggest hypocrite in the world today. I can prove it and document it. That hypocrite is so holy he won't flip a light switch on Saturday, but Monday he'll go down to the courthouse and slough off the life of his youth. And take another called Hadassah and fornicate with that poor every night. It's Bible. It's Bible. That's in Joe's Torah. They got Joe Lieberman in there, you know, they're talking about God every other sentence. What they're doing, it, it, what they're trying to do is to wash away the last several years of the crud from Clinton by talking religion now. If the, if the Republicans were talking religion like the Democrats are, there'd be a hue and cry from the media that they're trying to mix church and state. It's kind of like Clinton walking out of church with his Bible, you know, during the Monica Lewinsky thing. Give me a break. It's, it's just a ploy to try to play to the, the voting masses. Holy Joe, Joe Lieberman, <clears throat> world's biggest hypocrite. Hypocritical, nonsensical triviality is like not using a pen on the side of your so holy. You're a hypocrite, probably the biggest hypocrite in the world today. And you'll pick up that pen on money and write laws, strengthening the right for these fool American women to kill their babies. Joe Lieberman is one of the biggest baby killers, certifiable in the United States Senate, and hence, with that power, in the United States. I mean, how any intelligent person can listen to that pony and, and see him any other way than, than a 24-karat pony? I got an invitation to the presidential inauguration in 1992 from Al Gore. And my recollection is, although I could stand corrected, I got one in 1996. We went into the inaugural festivities and then we went outside and picketed certain things like fag. And he had fag wall to wall at that inaugural. Clinton. I want to give you my candid gut feeling based on what I know of, of uh, Mr. Gore. I, I think I know him better than the average person. I really think what he's done, although I'm quite up unhappy with it, in selling out to the homosexuals and going to all these political fundraisers and so on. I think when the rubber actually hits the road, I don't think he would be near prone to be as extreme and as dedicated and committed. I don't think he's quite the, as perverted, if you will, as Bill Clinton. I think Clinton really felt it down deep inside.
I think he's, I think he's a, a pervert. I think Gore's doing it more for political expediency. <laughs> you know, we pick it at Gore so many times, you know, he knows us real well. And he, he's getting madder and madder all the time. Pick it at his dad's funeral in Nashville, and he saw us. And we pick it at him when he went to make a speech at Harvard, you know, that Kennedy School of Business at Harvard. And they got a nice place there, ideal for picketing, where it comes across that James River and sweeps out broadly. I mean, it's just wonderful. Big, broad streets, traffic flowing in every direction. And there we were, with Gore's picture on those signs. And he's in a limousine. He sits up there looking like that, just looking like that. Look at the one little sign the other. These uh, politicians, uh, under pressure from majoritarian forces, dominated by clever, talented, ambitious, eager, diabolical, homosexual activists, have got these idiots believing that if they vote in Congress, they can say, it's okay to be gay. That's what the devil told Eve in Genesis 3. Has God said not to eat this fruit? She said, God said, if you eat that fruit, you're going to die. The devil's next words were, you shall not surely die. But God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, you'll be as God, knowing good and evil, a tree to be desired to make one wise, pleasant to the eyes. The devil persuaded her that the word of God means nothing, that there are no teeth in it, and no repercussions of divine and eternal uh, ramifications. Boy, that, now that is very good preaching. I gotta remember some of that stuff. Some, some days you spit it out better than other days, you know. One, two, three, four, five. Once far from God and dead in sin, no light my heart can see. I've watched this now for years, and the media is going to do what they want to do. Uh, none of them have spent any time with us. They have no idea who we are or what we are. It's so offensive when people say we're parrots, or that we're like a cult with this charismatic leader who does our thinking. My dad never let anybody do anybody's thinking except ourselves. He insisted that we think things through. It's unfortunate, but that's the way the media operates. Their, their job is to... Uh, sell newspapers and get get a television audience and they also have an agenda a lot of them do there's no human that I've loved and grown up with that is appropriately lumped with anything hateful or um, blindly prejudice but so it goes that's the society we live in I don't think there's any mystery that certainly some of the major national networks are left leaning it's, it's quite a, it cracks me up sometimes just to listen to their wording. We're not part of the religious right. They're as offensive to us as the, matter of fact, many, many times they're more violent toward us than the uh, homosexuals. When Christ was on this earth and he says repeatedly, they hate me, they'll hate you, they'll speak all manner of evil against you, it's just a way to when you have a message that is so clear and carries its credibility in its teeth, so to speak, you've got to then uh, vilify or demonize the messenger if you don't like the message. Religion, true religion, isn't about politics. It's the, it's the antithesis of politics. Whatever rhetoric, 
white noise they need to have out there, so be it as long as they publish the message. That's the ultimate. We can't control how they spin this stuff. And the fact that they have to keep spinning it tells me that they feel the force of our basic position or they wouldn't spend so much time and energy on it. And underneath all that white noise, they know. It's an axiomatic matter of fact that you can't go through this life, which is at its fundamental level, a moral universe. You can't go through this life, travel in a moral universe, essentially a moral universe, and not expect to have controversy over that issue of morality, right and wrong. And you guys can't duck it like Pontius Pilate calling for a basin of water so he could publicly wash his hands and say, I have nothing to do with the blood of this righteous man, but you take him out and crucify him. It's an impossibility to straddle that fence. Break these signs out in some public place. Display them. And it will only be a matter of minutes, if not seconds, before the same kind of vicious fag attack, we call it. Fag attack. Fag attack. Hey, Munger! Hey, Munger! Hey, Mongers! Hey, Mongers! Get back to where you came from! Get back into the goddamn wherever the fuck you came from! You hate, you hate people, hate monger! of them gather, gather around there, there'll pretty soon be some kind of physical violence. You know that, but God loves everybody. Vandalized this church 17 times, shot out the glass and the sign 13, I think it is, times. When they set the bomb off, though, that was the last straw, so I put out a $5,000 reward and caught them. They set it off over there by Cheryl's house, not far from where one of her little babies, just a few weeks old, was sleeping. And the guy got 14 days in jail for it. Did I have to tell you what would happen if we set off a bomb at one of these fag churches? We'd, I'd still be in the penitentiary. There was a very public trial where the former prosecutor had filed charges against a lady who had t taken her truck and tried to run 20 of us down in front of Washburn University. Uh, the jury acquitted her. The facts were undisputed. There wasn't any question that she drove a car up there. But because the jury didn't like the message that we were preaching, they acquitted her. And it's not f a logical extension from that to, to, for us to believe, reasonably believe, that if she had killed one of us, they would have acquitted her. A human government is, is, is constituted by the Almighty, but it plainly says it was constituted in order to punish wicked people and in order to uh, deliver good people. And it is a perversion of the government of God when you see uh, these uh, institutions of human government punishing righteousness and vindicating evil. This Elizabeth Birch, who is the head of this biggest of all fag groups called the Human Rights Campaign, and her partner, Hillary 
Rosen, and they're the leaders. They're the power couple in Washington. And Elizabeth Birch is the one they quote in this story about me saying that Fred Phelps is a walking hate crime. See, they think if you say God hates fags, if you say that thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, that that ought to be a crime, a hate crime. And their rationale is that you are thereby encouraging the lunatic fringe to beat up and kill gay people. That argument's defective because it proves too much. See what it says, that you can't preach the Bible because it might make some people mad and they'll do crazy things. But it's got traction. That argument's got traction. All this business of reporting hate crimes about fags that they use as empirical evidence to urge the passage of laws is deceptive and misleading because they report hate crimes when I'm out there with those signs. They report that as a hate crime. What they mean when they say it is, stop Phelps from preaching that God hates fags. But they know they can't say it in so many words because they run square into the First Amendment. You can take your First Amendment and put it where the sun don't shine because you're interpreting it away anyhow. You filthy fag judges from one end of this country to the other and legislators and city councils and county commissions pass laws, rules, regulations just as fast as their perverted minds and wills and hands can work. Do your worst! I dare you! Try to stop us! my opinion that the news media is totally corrupt and totally, I mean totally, dedicated to the militant fag agenda. They skew every story, all their editorial decisions are made, uh, predicated in one way or another. They, they will sanitize the filthiness of the fags at every opportunity and they will not run any story with any kind of enthusiasm that paints uh, the fag culture in its true light. In fact, the whole entertainment in industry is, is in a kind of a slavish uh, modality to the fag agenda. There's not one of them that dares say one word that even questions uh, that it's okay to be gay. I mean, just say one word. Like, uh, if, you, if you were some movie star or some some famous comic or entertainer and you in some conspicuous manner said I don't know I just wonder if that's a healthy lifestyle that's all you have to say your career is over unless you grovel and apologize wholly given over to the fag agenda and you got to worship at the shrine of the almighty anal copulating uh, God it's, the, it's the, the great God rectum that's what we call it. You got to worship that God or you are through in the entertainment industry and, and for the most part, the mass media. Two guys, one of them named Josh Brown, I forget the other one, they were businessmen in Rogers, Arkansas. Those guys got this little 13-year-old Jesse Durkheising, D-I-R-K-H-I-S-I-N-G, and ta taped his mouth shut taped his little wrist behind him, he was a skinny little pitiful thing, taped his, taped his uh, eyes closed and sodomized him to death, literally to death. The media wouldn't run that story. AP wouldn't run it outside of Arkansas. A little local news. Finally, months later, we had something to do with it because we went down there and picketed that situation and brought focused attention on it and sent out our flowers and things. Uh, finally, 
Paula Zahn, bless her heart, she ran a story about it. And it was a wonderful story. It showed out there and played it off against that, against that Matt Shepard coverage, comparing it. And it showed out at his little graveyard with nothing there but a few dead flowers and said, there wasn't anybody at this funeral compared to the hordes of media and people around at Matthew Shepard's funeral in, in Wyoming. That's the media. Now, it, it is not accidental or, or uh, random. It is, it is as though they all had a big meeting and it all generates from the same diabolical brain, His Majesty the Devil. You know Michael Moore? Look, he sent, a, he sent a crew out here. I mean, four or five, I mean, really good quality people. And they stayed around here for three or four days, took a lot of footage. And that girl, she kept calling and working on it. She was so proud. She says, now it's coming on this date right here. She says, you're going to like it. It's just wonderful. We got all this. It never happened. And so about a year later, Moore himself was out here, right out there with a big half block long RV pink. He had painted pink, pink saying on the side, this is the Sodom Express or something, and full of fags. He, he paid fags to come with him to Topeka and park out there and carry on. And I said, well, why should I talk to you, Mike? He said, last time we talked and talked and said, Never came. Oh, well, he said, that was my program that had those sponsors called the TV Nation, is what they called it. He says, and it was just too, it was just too favorable. It just showed you people in too favorable light. He said, they wouldn't let me. I said, well, that's what's going to happen with this one. Why should I bother talking? I was just joking a little bit, see. He said, no, he says, this is, I got more control. I got more control. <laughs> that's the answer to your question about what, what I think about the media. It's diabolical. And we count on it. We absolutely count on it. And no matter what we do, what we say, it's going to come out skewed that we are heavy, with the heavy, with the uh, hate mongers and uh, troublemakers. That's fine with us, as long as every night, that's what the apostle says, whether in pretense or in truth, just so they put some of the stuff that we say, that God hates fags, and that uh, fags burn in hell, and that uh, all that other good stuff we say leaks out. It's everywhere. The hottest part of hell is reserved for these false preachers. They're to blame for the condition that this country's in. And it's no surprise to me that the mainline churches are the ones now that are the most dedicated to promoting this goofy notion that it's okay to be gay. All of them without exception. And they're Bible illiterate. It's amazing how little these guys, these preachers, these priests know about the Bible. They never studied the Bible. They don't teach them that at the seminaries. Their theological training consists in how to manage matters. They teach them the routine and the rote, the ceremonies, and how to have uh, funerals f appropriately, and weddings appropriately, Christmas, Easter, the church calendar, be Mr. Hale fellow, well met, get along with everybody, be good fundraisers, good administrators, uh, good uh, tacticians, uh, with the end being always in view, uh, that gain is godliness. That's all the theological schools teach. And I'm going to make you some mighty in the scriptures, servant of God Almighty, that knows big chunks of the Bible by heart, and has got a tightly woven, systematic, theological position. That's not what they're turning out. Therefore, they're not equipped. You cannot go through any seminary without cracking a Bible and reading it. You can't read the Bible from beginning to end. Any spot, open it, and you find what we're saying. So it's almost like a level of betrayal. The stark reality is that 99 and 9 tenths percent of the population is probably going to hell and uh, going to spend eternity there. Now that doctrine is not popular. They're not going to have any preacher telling them anything except what makes them feel good. And every one of these preachers, so-called, has shirked their responsibility to tell them what they ought to hear instead of what they want to hear. They don't know any Bible, and what little they know, uh, they pervert. And it's the verses that apply is they, that they, uh, they uh, 
perverse disputings by men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness and walking in craftiness and handling the word of God uh, deceitfully. Bible preachers are supposed to use Bible metaphors, Bible terminology, Bible words. We don't have the luxury, if you want to call it that, of these various options. This is not a smorgasbord religion that we have been entrusted with. It's not a sincere dispute. It's an insincere, diabolical, knowing, knowing the truth, but determined to pervert it because they know that the masses that they're dealing with are more Bible illiterate and ignorant than they are, and they can pull that stuff off. Furthermore, it's uh, pleasant. How bountiful, how voluminous is this blessed word of God. And it's got such wonderful stuff written in it, all about love and happiness and everybody's so good and kind and sweet and all. No! You're not preaching lamentations and mourning and woe, brother, then you're a lying false prophet. You're telling these miserable hell-bound bathhouse, wallowing, anal, copulating fags that God loves them? You have bats in the belfry. You got rooms to let upstairs. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables, and heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's a Hebrewism, and it means that they are always listening to see what the popular thing is to say. All the nuances of contemporary popularity they pick up on quickly. Got itching ears. Don't tell me anything about culture has moved on. This book still stands. And the severest kinds of woes are denounced against those that would mess with it. There, there is no substantive uh, rational defense. I mean, the other side doesn't have a case. I mean, you, you want to try to show from the Bible that it's okay to be gay, that it's okay to anally copulate your brains out. You're going to try to show from the Bible that those 12 little words no longer have any force or effect. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Those 12 little words no longer have any force or effect and it is now okay to be gay. Uh, you got a job. Man, I, I don't envy you at all. There is no substantive defense. You can't substantively debate with Brother Phelps. You know what I'm telling you, Steve? You cannot do it. You've got to resort to policy arguments and ad hominem. You're all fat. You're off from the South. I can't believe this. You're sick. You are sick. Were your parents siblings? But you need to diet there, buddy. I think there this isn't one, one is a diet. Don't name call. I'm from Kansas, and you are a shame. You this woman said, screaming and yelling the other day at one of the pickets, says, you don't do anything but cause trouble everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. God doesn't hate. God doesn't hate. You don't know the Bible. The Bible's full of love. Love. There's no love and no love. What happened to the God of love? You understand, beloved, that the truth of the matter is that these people we're dealing with are abysmally Bible illiterate. That woman said, don't you think that you could change your approach a little? Because you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. What I said was, Bible preaching, genuine Bible preaching is so rare nowadays that you just don't recognize it, honey, that you just don't recognize it when you hear it. So you got a spontaneous reaction.
against it because all you've ever heard out of these lying false prophets calling themselves preachers nowadays is kissy poo, clap trap, syrupy nonsense that take your miserable, loud mouth soul straight to hell. And God hates you. And I mean that in the People kindest are. way. And furthermore, said I to her, I'm not, I'm not trying to catch flies. What's the matter with you? You understand that one of the greatest joys that anybody has in this life is to know stuff. You get fresh knowledge and all. There's nothing more, more, uh, more important to that element of the rational creature than the capacity to know stuff. And that grows. So this idea, and because we can't understand everything there is to understand about the Bible and all these things now, uh, it therefore is what? Uh, flawed? No, it's just the, just the opposite. We started this discussion on the premise that the Bible was infallible. If you don't accept that premise, to hell with you. Scriptures are a very sensible book, and it insults God Almighty to think that you can deal with it in any way at all. It says some things for sure, and it doesn't say other things for sure. And an intelligent human being has the capacity to read that book and be warned of God of the truth. That this is a supernatural book. Man could not be the originator or author of it, but that God Almighty alone could be speaking to my heart with such power and force and internal persuasion. But if you're an impenitent sinner, you can cavalierly cast it aside and say, ah, it's just another book. I'll live like I want to live. But the reason you're saying that is you, you're married to some sin you're sucking on and you don't want to even think about giving it up. I bet you know every one of these filthy ass songs by Henry. Shame on you. Bragging about not knowing the Bible. Shame on you. Some fool making a paralogism argument to me lately said it's disproportionate. It's simply not fair. Tell me that I lived on earth 40, 50, 60, 70 years and did all the sinning I was capable of. And then tell me that that's going to be paid or punished by suffering exquisite torments in hell forever. That's disproportionate. That's not fair. That is a paralogism. Brother, you're not in hell as a retribution in kind, proportionately meted out according to that limited, finite amount of sin you did on earth. You're still a sinner. You're still transgressing. You're still hating God. You're still uh, despising His Word. You're still contemptuous of His people. You're still of that modality that frivolously says, Ah, Phelps is going to heaven, I want to go to hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you are. So much compromise and uh, perfidy. You know perfidy? Mendacity. You know mendacity? All those are good words to describe the religious fundamentalists and evangelicals in this perfidy and mendacity. I think Jerry Falwell wants to be a televangelist more than he wants to go to heaven. I think that's the most important thing to him. I think he would sell his grandmother if that's what was required of him. You know those old, old time Baptists, they didn't even believe in passing collection plates inside the church. Never passed a plate. Let alone ask for money. Jerry Falwell would stand up and tell you plain and straight what the Bible says about homosexuality. And then he will stand up and tell you plain and straight how wrong we are for telling it plain and straight. I don't think you ought to make money off religion. And the exemplar in the scriptures is Simon the sorcerer who approached Paul and says, I'll give you money if you'll give me this gift of religion you've got. And Paul said, what amounts in a free translation, you and your money both go to hell. What he said was, thy, thy silver perish with thee. For thou thoughtest that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You got all these phony preachers, these deadhead priests, these TV evangelists, speaking, speaking. But God all
Almighty never gave them the book to eat. I think that they have, I think that they understand what the scripture says, and I think that on purpose they're not telling people what it says because they want the money. They got to have the money. Robertson got what he calls the 700 Club. All you have to do to join the 700 Club is send money. It don't matter what kind of a filthy low life you are. If you send money, you're a member of that club. If you don't send money, it don't matter how holy and righteous and godly you are. You can't belong. So, what kind of mess is that? It turns people away when they find out what it really says. They say, oh, I don't want to believe that. That, that, that hurts my feelings. I don't, I don't like this stuff. I'm, I'm not going to believe this. I'm not giving this guy money to promote this kind of stuff that I don't agree with. If you get somebody like my old pal Billy Graham, at least he comes off with a show of sincerity and genuineness. And you wouldn't think he even believed in hell anymore and he coddles and sucks up to fags and any other kind of a hell-bound sinner. Well, pick at his sorry ass. I already told him. I told him. Hey, we're going to pick at him. He says that that's his last uh, crusade. So I wrote him and I said, we're going to pick at you at your last crusade or at your funeral if it comes before your last crusade, or both if it comes after your last crusade. We're going to pick at his funeral. It's going to be a grand, glorious affair, too. They'll have people preaching him into heaven from all, <laughs> from all over the country. Conveying the notion that salvation is anything but free is pernicious. And one, I don't care how nicely you try to spin it, when you hook up asking for money with the preaching of the gospel, you're conveying the idea that somehow you can buy your way into heaven. Billy Graham is a false prophet. Billy Graham suggests that you don't even have to believe in Christ and you can still go to heaven. You're preaching lies to these kids. Does the judge send the criminal or the crime to the penitentiary? Do they execute the murderer or just the murderer? Does God send the sinner to hell or just his sin to hell? And he goes to heaven. It's pure silliness. There's not one ounce of Bible for that. Did you not see his interview on television when he told the entire nation that you could be a Buddhist or any other religion or never even have heard of Jesus Christ and you could still go to heaven? You know, old Graham was on that Larry King show, and somebody asked him, could Jews go to heaven? And he wallowed around there and kind of said yes, for crying out loud. The Lord God turned away from the Jews because they rejected him. And he, and he turned unto the Gentiles to call out a people for his name. And he gave them to understand, unequivocally, in the graphic, most gross language, that they would become a proverb and a byword and a hissing amongst the nations. You know, it's, it's a very uh, sad uh, thing, uh, the Jews, because this that's happened to them in every age and in every place is so plainly set out in the scriptures where the prophets told them this is going to happen to you. And Paul, who himself was a Jew, uh, says in uh, First uh, Thessalonians that they are hateful, and that they m murdered uh, uh, their own prophets, and they murdered our Lord Jesus Christ, and they uh, can't get along with anybody. But he says, I have a great uh, heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for my brethren, the Jews. Uh, and he says, uh, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They are so hard-hearted and so unrepentant and they will out of their own mouths in a most mocking fashion talk about how many homosexuals they have in their ranks. They have in a big way rejected God and he has in a big way rejected them. 
I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ plainly told those people and all their ancestors, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And where I go, you cannot come. I mean, there's not a one of them going to heaven. They're just ordinary sinners. They've got to repent like everybody else. And they, there's no repentance given them outside of that that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know that horrendous things have happened in the name of religion. We're not asking anybody to do anything except remember what the ground rules are and remember the danger that it imposes upon all of us as a society when we flee those ground rules. As long as you imagine the vain thing that we're just these humans that think that you're different and weird, that these human beings that are holding these signs hate you, then you're going to miss fire every time you fire at us. If we hated you, we would care less about where you're headed with your soul. The supreme act of love is to stand and warn you that your conduct is leading you to eternal hell. What I see when I look across the landscape of this country today, I don't hear any unambiguous voice. There are a few people who are out there, and I, and I take a great deal of comfort in what the Lord God said to Jeremiah. If you take the precious from the vile, you shall be as my mouth. I want, to, I want that. I want to be a proper spokesman in this day for these vital issues. I want to be, if I could be so bold, the mouth of God in this earth. I'm not blaming the Lord God for my uh, sins and anything else. I'm I'm, I'll take whatever blame there is. But uh, I'm not willing to concede that I have not followed the Lord Jesus Christ by His grace this whole exciting journey since I was 16 years old. A ruddy face is what they put on my draft card. A ruddy If I was just looking at the prophets of God, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the times they lived in, the purpose that they served, I would say that my dad, my dad is a prophet. The bottom line is, if you look at what the Bible refers to as a prophet, yeah, there's somebody who has, they're an ambassador of God. They go, they have a message from God and they're delivering it faithfully. I'm, I'm at the place now, you know, where I don't have a, a whole lot further to go. And I'm feeling pretty doggone good about things, Steve. <laughs> they start out laying their hands on my head out of out of uh, Second Timothy four one and two, and now I'm about down to Second Timothy four uh, six and seven. One and two says, "I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word." Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I got there. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and being turned away from having turned away from the truth, they shall be turned unto fables. And then it says, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've finished my course, my course. I've kept the faith, and henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. See, there's a neat little circle there in that Second Timothy chapter 4. It's the way it starts out,
preach the word, the way it ends up, I've finished my course and there's a crown of righteousness. You ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Got this guy named Christian and he's making his way from the city of destruction to the, to the heavenly city. And as he gets near the end, he comes upon what he calls the delectable mountains. Delectable. Where all manner of pleasant fruit grows and where it is so close to the heavenly city that some of the inhabitants seem to come and and visit once in a while. I mean, it just gets kind of... I'm, I'm in the delectable mountains or getting close to them. If you believe that, say amen.